Well, hello there. My name is Jan Burt, and this is my podcast, The Burt Not Ernie Show, where we talk about God's promises and the hope those promises bring to our everyday lives. Whenever I meet somebody new, I introduce myself as Jan Burt and say, like Burt and Ernie, since it's easy to confuse my last name with a different one. And almost always, people smile when they think of Burt and Ernie. That got me thinking. I'm a Burt, and I'm not an Ernie. But how often do we live as if we're someone God never meant for us to be? Part of knowing who you are is knowing who you're not. Hence the name, The Burt Not Ernie Show. I'm so glad you're here. Let's dig into God's promises. Well, hello to you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Burt Not Ernie Show. I am excited today to be sharing some pretty awesome promises directly from the Word of God. Uh, This is a milestone episode, and so we are going to talk about some promises that are just like, I think, super encouraging for all of us, no matter where you're at in life right now, no matter what you're going through. I really think this is going to be encouraging for you, no matter what you're facing, no matter what victory you are are just rejoicing and celebrating in, no matter what. It's a good show today. Uh, I'm also hosting a giveaway Yay for giveaways, right? I love a good giveaway to celebrate episode number 150. And so there's a little link at the top of the show notes you can click on so you can enter, have a chance to win um, things like Amazon gift cards, coffee gift cards. Who doesn't need a good cup of coffee now and then? I have several prizes for several winners and it's super easy to enter. So I hope you'll do that. And also, I'm officially launching my new podcast the prayer podcast with Jan L. Burt. I hope that you will check that out. And, uh, you know, the episodes on that one, it's going to be shorter form content. So between 10 and 15 minutes long. And of course, I'm going to be praying in every single episode. So when you listen, you're going to be encouraged with what the Bible says about prayer, because it's so encouraging when we know what God's word says about the way that we are to communicate with him, to ask for and receive things from him, to be able to intercede on behalf of other people and situations um, and just go to the throne room of grace to find mercy and obtain help at our point of need, right? It's prayer is hugely important, but you're also going to be covered in prayer as I pray for the listeners in every episode. So, and also if you happen to leave a rating or review for the new show, the prayer podcast that gets you bonus entries in the giveaway. So a big show today, big promises we're going to look at today. And you know, with the Lord God almighty, a promise made really is as good as a promise kept. You ready? Let's get started. You're listening to the Burt Not Ernie show, part of the Spark Network now playing via the Edify app. This is episode number 150. All right, so today on the show, we are taking a look at more than just one or two verses. Nope, today for the milestone 150th episode, we are taking it a bit further. We're going to look at a couple of chapters from the New Testament book of Matthew. And the reason that we're going to do sort of a flyover look at these two chapters is because there's a whole lot here about God making promises and then boom, keeping them, like fulfilling them to the letter. These portions of scripture show us that God will never fail, will never fail to do every single thing that he has promised to do. And you know, when God starts to move, Boy, does he ever get things moving. No matter how wild the promises and prophecies may have seemed, especially were you to be like, you know, think of, think of in the time before Jesus was born, you're considering all of these prophecies that are about the Messiah. Say you're thinking about these things and you're like, I don't know, how is this, wait, how is this going to work out? How is this and that possible at the same time? How? Like, how? how, Huh? These chapters show us that our God is not only the God who does impossible things, but he's the God who promises impossible things, and then he makes good. It is incredibly encouraging, these verses we're going to look at in Matthew chapter 1 and 2. So in Matthew 1, first thing that we see is the genealogy of Jesus listed from Abraham down to Joseph, the husband of Mary, who was the mother of Jesus. Now we know that Joseph was not Jesus's father. It was a virgin birth, but this is given to us as the genealogy to show that, that God 
set all of this up. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew who was in the lineage of the one who would be raising Joseph, who would be raising Jesus. This is talking about Joseph alongside of the other children he had with Mary. So it is the genealogy that is given to us in the book of Matthew that we would know that God is so careful and pays attention to every detail all the way down to the coming of Jesus. And we need to know that because he's still paying attention to every detail in my life and yours right here and right now. And as an aside, in this listing of the ancestors here, we find some women who are specifically mentioned. So if you happen to be a woman, and uh, maybe just perhaps you feel as if you're not exactly sure that God has a meaningful purpose or place for you. These women being noted here in Matthew chapter one, so specifically, like it's there, there are these parentheses to tell you who they are. Like you don't find that ab- about every name listed in this genealogy. You just about certain women, though, you do find it. It tells you about whose mother they were. Um, you know, like this is really that's a way that the word of God is showing us that it's living and active. And it is, as it says in the book of Hebrews, God's word is telling you that you matter. You matter because God says you do. So we've got Tamar, the mother of Perez and Zerah, who was father to Judah. This is a big deal. Tamar's story, uh, Judah said she's more righteous than I am at the end of it. And I'm not going to go into all of what that story was, but talk about a woman who, who uh, knew what she was entitled to what God had for her, she went after it and she got it and was declared righteous by the the one who um, probably wanted to have her killed and who had really wronged her. Okay, so you have Tamar. Uh, We have Boaz listed, whose mother was Rahab. And so think about that. Boaz's mother was Rahab. And Boaz, actually, I think Boaz's grandmother was Rahab, maybe his mother. I'll have to check this. Sorry, I'm going from memory and I'm fuzzy on this. Uh, Boaz, of course, married Ruth, who was the mother of Obed, who was the father of Jesse and the father of King David. And you know what? I think I was correct the first time. Boaz's mother was Rahab. Think about that. Remember Rahab? Joshua? The red cord in the window? She seemed to be running like a brothel, and yet she and her whole family were saved and protected, the mother of Boaz. Boaz married Ruth, who was the mother of Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of King David. This is incredible. Ruth was another woman that was like, she was a Moabite woman. Moabites were very much despised among the Jews. And yet here she is entering into the the lineage here, this genealogy that's listed in Matthew 1, leading up to Jesus as a way of showing he is the Messiah. That's what this genealogy is to show us, that Jesus is the Messiah. Everything was done perfectly and in order. Isn't God good? Isn't this encouraging? Like, And the fourth woman mentioned in Matthew 1 was Bathsheba, and she's described as the widow of Uriah, the widow of Uriah. Those few words remind me that God sees our deepest points of anguish, grief, and pain. And you better believe Bathsheba went through some anguish and some grief and some pain. We often think of her maybe as just kind of a harlot type. No, no. No, no, no. She wasn't bathing on the rooftop to be promiscuous. The springtime was the time when kings went out to war. Nobody should have been around to see her. Her husband was one of David's mighty men, and he was off at war. We see no indication that she did not love her husband dearly. When soldiers came and took her to the palace of the king, she could not possibly have known what was coming for her. That this had to do with David's giving in to lust of the flesh, which led to murdering Uriah and just absolute heartbreak, and then the death of the baby. This was really a tragedy. Like, it could be like Shakespearean type of a tragedy. It really is heartbreaking. So rather than just assume she was just a harlot looking for this, when she was summoned by soldiers, you wouldn't say no to that as a woman in that culture. You had no choice. You had to go. And her husband was a mighty man, one of David's mighty men. He was bad to the bone. He was a warrior. She might have feared that she was getting bad news about him. Okay, so here she is listed, and the description is that she is the widow of Uriah. Widow grieving and anguish and pain. That is how she is acknowledged. This is a beautiful, beautiful picture for us of God as our comforter and that women matter tremendously to him. He is so good at giving us the comfort we need as we need it. He sees us and every now and then as women, as female Christians, this can be a timely reminder and I hope it's encouraging to you whether you're male or female. I hope that men, if you're raising daughters, you can hear this and say, yes, 
yes, yes, you have a good place for my daughter in your kingdom because God does. Encourage your wife in this. Um, If you can just remind a woman that she matters, you never know. You never know what a difference that might make in her life at this point in time right now. Okay, verse 17 in the New Living Translation says, All those listed above include 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the Babylonian exile, and 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. Just from that one verse, we can see how true it is that God is a God of order and not of chaos. The world at large, or our own small corner of the world, can seem pretty chaotic. We can always turn to the one who is not chaotic and who will always be a God of order. That is important to know. That is an important thing to kind of hang your hat on. No matter how chaotic it feels, our God is not a God of chaos and we can run to him and expect comfort and help and everything we might need in the midst of what feels, seems, or actually is truly chaotic. Starting with verse 18 in Matthew chapter 1, the focus turns to the birth and then the early years of the life of Jesus, the Messiah. Verse 19 says that Joseph planned to break his engagement with Mary quietly so as not to disgrace her publicly. What a good man. After he learned of her pregnancy, that's like break it off quietly to not disgrace her publicly when he learned she was pregnant. Truly, what a good man. And then it says verse 20, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, to Joseph, in a dream and told him who the child actually was, told him to give the baby the name Jesus, and that this child would grow up and save his people from their sins. Verses 22 through 24 say this, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, He did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife. So the promise, the prophecy was originally made as we read it back in um, Isaiah chapter 7, 8, and 10. And boom, looky here, God kept that promise. Pretty big promise to both make and keep, wouldn't you say? A virgin birth? That's a big one. Pretty impossible. And it sounds like God's specialty. And I love the fact that when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded. I love that his heart to obey the Lord. Chapter two, verse one says that Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. Uh, I'm going to read verses five and six from the New Living Translation. In Bethlehem in Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea are not least among the ruling cities of Judea, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Second promise or prophecy we find fulfilled here because the prophetic is really just God, God's promise. So um, I'm referring to those kind of interchangeably regarding this text here today. Uh, from Micah 5 and 2 Samuel 5, look how perfectly the Lord keeps his promises here. Joseph and Mary, they did not live in Bethlehem, but they were there to be counted and registered so that they could pay taxes. They had to travel to the town that had to do with family lineage. And so there they found themselves, as it says in Luke chapter 2, there they were. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she, Mary, gave birth to her firstborn, a son, the Lord Jesus. Now, after the wise men had altered, or sorry, alerted, not altered, they altered their path back to avoid evil King Herod after they had alerted him to the newborn king of the Jews, because apparently nobody who should have noticed among the Jews was really, really noticing, oh, yeah, that prophi- prophesied uh, star, you know, the the the, pro- the star that we see in the sky is showing us where the Messiah has been born. Uh, they knew when they were asked, where will the baby be born? Well, it's in Bethlehem. You know, he called, King Herod calls him in. They roll out their scrolls. They tell him where the baby would be born, but they weren't connecting the dots. These men from the East were connecting the dots. So, First, they uh, alerted Herod to something he didn't know, and then they uh, avoided him by sneaking around a different path home so as not to be killed by him because they weren't fools. Okay, so um, look, 
he had a major freak out. He sent his marauders. I'm going to call them that rather than soldiers because butchering babies is not something that my husband would have done as a soldier. So I'm going to say marauders. Marauders it is. They went and killed all the baby boys age two and under. Verse 13 says, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him to get up to flee with the child and his mother to Egypt and to stay there until they were told to return. Joseph did what he always did, which was to obey right away. He woke up from the dream. He got Mary and Jesus ready and off they went. And hence they were spared from this horrible thing that happened in Bethlehem to those families, to those little boys, those toddlers, those babies. Verse 14 14 says that that night Joseph took them and left for Egypt. And let me tell you, obedience matters. And the quicker you obey the Lord, the better. Just have your mind made up and be prayed up in this area. Ask him to give you feet that are quick to obey, that move at his leading and his command, and to not delay or dawdle. And I mean that. You can pray for that. You'll be blessed by praying that prayer and living obediently. Well, guess what? Others are going to be blessed by your obedience too. It's a win-win when we are fast about our obedience. Verses 17 and 18. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. This happened exactly as Jeremiah prophesied it would. The Lord did not want those baby boys killed. Let's make note of that really important truth. This was not what God wanted. This is evil. And this was foretold to Jeremiah so that when this horrible, awful thing occurred, and it was so awful, a cry heard in Rama, weeping for her children who were dead, so awful, so awful. I would not be able to be comforted as a mom of a toddler who, but this is just horrible to think about, right? This is like the crying out here is a really heart-wrenching, very awful, terrible kind of grief refusing to be comforted kind of grief. If you're a mom, you you can kind of get an image in your mind of what this would be like. This was so awful. We just need to recognize that Jeremiah foretold it so that when this awful thing occurred, it would stand out as a terrible moment in Israel's history. It's to be noted as one more proof of the Messiah Jesus. So never doubt how far the devil will go in his outward acts of hatred toward the Lord and toward the people who love the Lord. That's you and me. Here he acted through a man, King Herod, who evidently did not have a whole lot of trouble responding to the promptings of Satan to do his dirty work. Evil is real. Satan hates Jesus, and there are people who do the devil's bidding. Jeremiah's prophetic words were proved true. Now that's just three astounding and pretty impossible prophecies or promises that were kept down to the tiniest detail, just as the Lord predicted through his prophets, and then via the written record of his words as given to those prophets. We are starting to move into the realm of statistical improbability here in Matthew chapter 1 and 2. We should be a bit amazed at this, like amazed and in awe of God. The last several verses from Matthew chapter 2 remind us that when Herod died, an angel appeared yet again to Joseph in another dream and told him, now take the child and his mother back to Israel, because those who were trying to kill the child had died. Joseph didn't hear this news via the grapevine. The paper didn't land on his doorstep one toasty, warm Egyptian morning. He didn't have to wait around and get the deets, the details from some relative sending a message via camel or something. No, God sent an angel in a dream to tell him now's the time to go back home. And of course, per his character, verse 21 says that Joseph got up and returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. Like he had the dream, then he woke up, he got up out of bed, he got busy doing what he'd been told to do. Man, he was not a dawdler or a delayer or a dream denier. Joseph was not a doddler, Joseph was not a delayer, and Joseph was not a dream denier. Does that remind you of another Joseph who was in Egypt at a point prior to this, thousands of years before? It sure does me. He was a man of obedient action, and I have learned a lot about quick obedience and about how the Lord speaks to his people who will listen and heed. I have learned a lot about that from the life of Joseph. I want to obey like this, like Challenge accepted, Lord, help me to obey like Joseph obeyed. Verses 22 and 23 finish off this chapter. 
But when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son, he was afraid to go back there. Then, after being warned in a dream, he left for the region of Galilee. Now, those who say that it's not a New Testament kind of a thing, a new covenant thing for God to speak to his people through dreams. Well, you know, uh, I want to I use a soundbite. I don't know if you've heard it, if you are on social media enough to have heard this little soundbite, the find it in the Bible, find it in the Bible. You know, if you can show me in the Bible where, where God has somehow put a stopping point under the New Covenant, New Testament era, that age that we're in now, or any time since Jesus stepped onto the scene as Messiah, where where God said, nope, not, not, no more dreams. Dreams are over and done with. If you can show me, find it in the Bible. I'd love to see it because what I see in my New Testament is God speaking through dreams, through angels and dreams and in visions. So there's that. Do with that whatever you will, my friend, but don't be too quick to decide on behalf of God that this is a thing he isn't going to do anymore. I've heard too many stories of missionaries who come to some village and the people there are, are Christ followers and there's no reason why they should be Christ followers. And then they finally get down in the weeds enough to figure out at some point, somebody or multiple people in that village had dreams where Jesus or an angel spoke to them and revealed who the Messiah was. God still speaks to us through dreams. Maybe sometimes we don't ever get a dream because we don't want a dream. I'm just going to leave that there. Um, Okay, so now Joseph, quick to obey, left for the regions of Galilee because of this next dream that's like, don't go there, go here instead. Okay, so he goes to the region of Galilee, not back where he was from. So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. This fulfilled what the prophets had said, he will be called the Nazarene. Look at all these promises. Out of Egypt, I've called my son. Yep, that actually happened. Uh, He'll be born in Bethlehem. Yep, that actually happened. He will be a Nazarene from the area of Galilee. Yep, that happened. Can you see how if you were looking at this uh, prior to all of these events happening, you would be like, wait, how can the Messiah be from all of these different places at once? And yet look at what God did. That's a lot of kept promises. Don't you just love this? Isn't this encouraging as a reminder to us that he is going to do exactly what he said that he will do? There's no ifs, no ands, and no buts about it. He's going to do it. He will. He really, really will. So reassuring is what these verses are. They're a huge boon to our faith, like a super booster for faith enhancement. Do you believe better when you hear about fulfilled promises? Like, do you actually believe better? I do. I hope so. I hope you do. You sure should. This is who your God is. His character is untarnishable. He said it and he means to do it. And so it will be done. So prophecies from Isaiah, from Micah, from 2 Samuel, from Hosea, and from Jeremiah, all specifically mentioned here and noted as being fulfilled. Check the box. It's done, baby. So this baby, the Messiah, uh, is going to be from Bethlehem somehow and also from Galilee and Nazarene and also somehow called out of Egypt. Yes, that's exactly right. Now, what promise? Okay, question time for you. Now, what promise has God given you that seems impossible? Like this does. The Messiah, born in Bethlehem from Galilee and Nazarene and and called out of Egypt. That seems pretty impossible. What promise has God given you that seems impossible? Like it just, it, it can't, it does not, it cannot add up humanly speaking. Is Is your God a different God than the God of the Bible? Are you willing to lean in and trust all the more for what he has promised he will do based on what we just looked at here in Matthew 1 and 2? Because with God, a promise made is a promise kept. This is what I want you to see from this portion of scripture for this episode of the podcast. Do not miss the application for your actual walking around daily life. It's also something you can apply to those you're praying for. You can pray with more faith because you have been reminded today that God is going to keep his promises, no matter how tricksy they might seem. Uh, Trixie, that's like a Lord of the Rings quote. That's tricky, tricksy. Okay. God's got something for you and you can trust him to bring it about in his way and on his timetable. You can trust him. So you should trust him. It's so good to know that. We can learn so much from just these two chapters of the Bible. Isn't God's word good and amazing and just fantastic? What a gift we have in the word of God that we have it and can open it and read it and learn from it and apply it and be blessed. It's so amazing what we have access to. 
And that I'm going to say as a reminder to you right now to maybe uh, when you get done with this episode, would you just pray for those who don't have Bibles, that they would be provided, that people who have the ability to help fund Bible translation and, uh, you know, sneak Bibles into parts of the world where they're not, you know, where they're illegal, pray that those efforts would succeed and that they would have all that they need resource wise to get that done. Um, Okay. That was my rabbit trail, but I think it was a good one. Okay, now I've got a verse to share with you that is a promise that God has made and that God is going to keep. This is for you, so I'm going to read it and I'm going to pray it over you today. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 from the New Living Translation. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Okay, I'm going to read it once more. Sometimes you got to get loud, you know, you got to read it again sometimes and get the devil off your back, out of your hair, away from your ear where he's whispering lies. Sometimes we just need to read it again out loud with some oomph, some oomph. And God will generously provide all, not some, but all you need. Not your greed, not your wants, but your needs, all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. What's the leftover for? To share with others, not to build bigger barns and store up and hoard. Some translations say you will have all that you need to abound in every good work. I would I would think that that's a beautiful way to look at your life. I have everything I need to abound in every good work. And we know from the book of James that every good and perfect thing comes down from the Father of heavenly lights, whom there is no shadow of turning. Every good work, not every selfish work, not every um, so-so work. It's kind of about God, but mostly about me. Every good work. He's got you. And he is not in the business of letting go or dropping those that he is holding on to. He's got you now and he will always have you. You are safe in his hands. More than safe, you are engraved on the palms of his hands. So how could he possibly ever forget you? He can't. He won't. Won't happen. In uh, a course I have um, on Psalm 91, I say this again and again. Our job, our work is to believe. And when we aren't believing, we already have kind of done lost the whole ball game. That's why Satan works so hard to get us to live in a place of doubt, to live doubting lives. Today, I want to encourage you to choose belief. The Bible says your work is to believe the one whom God sent. Do that. Do that. You will. You will, according to 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, be generously provided for in your needs, not skimpily provided for, generously. And more than that, you're going to have everything you need and plenty left over. For what purpose? To share with others. What do you have plenty of? And who are you sharing that with? I've got plenty of like Bible journals from my daily morning study time over, you know, the last few decades, my time with the Lord when I have a pen and a journal open every single day. And so I have plenty to share with others. It's not impossible for me or even really all that difficult for me to find an encouraging verse or maybe sometimes a challenging or convicting verse to share on social media. I can pray for somebody Um, when, if they ask for prayer, like in that moment, I don't need to stop and go find verses. I've got them stored up because that's just something that I have plenty of because I put in the time to spend with the Lord every day. Yes, I am also trying to hopefully get you to think about whether or not you're keeping oil in your lamp and spending time with the Lord and in his word every day. And I also am going to be encouraging you to pray for other people when they need prayer. You don't always have to say, um, Uh, yeah, I'll pray for you later because you're nervous about praying with somebody. The biggest blessing you can give them might be to pray with them right there in that moment. Trust me, the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling you, you actually can do it. And you might bless them in ways, you know, they might be crying by the end of it. You just don't even know. Okay, so uh, what do you have that you can share? I just gave you one example of something that in case you're thinking, oh, I don't have a lot of money to share. But what do you what do you have? Can you encourage somebody? Are you a great encourager? Share that. This is just an example of ways to share with others. You, you really can post verses on social media. You really can text your friends. I'm praying for you. You can even text them the actual prayer. Send them an audio clip of you praying for them. I've done that before. And uh, I think it makes a difference because I've been told it makes a difference. Like rather than, oh, I'll pray for you rather than I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm going to send it to you. Man, what a blessing. There's so much more that we can be sharing with others from the plenty that God gives us. Take somebody to lunch. 
Make a donation to a ministry. Add a little extra to your tithes. Sponsor a kid who's trying to go to camp. Support a fundraiser. Not everything has to be a huge financial donation, but maybe maybe like a $5 bill. You get enough $5 bills, it adds up to a lot. You could be like Joseph and obey when, you know, boom, God said it. God leads, you obey. God leads, you obey. And then expect that you're going to have all you need and abundantly. That's the promise. That's the promise. You know, the Holy Spirit put this verse on my heart to add to this episode, to share with, in addition to Matthew 1 and 2. It makes it a longer episode than usual, but I know the Holy Spirit said, share this with them. So whoever needs to hear this, I hope you're really hearing it because the Holy Spirit rearranged and switched things up so that you would hear it. If you're sensing this is for me, I think this is what I needed from the Lord. This is something, maybe you read this verse or saw it somewhere earlier this week. And now you're like, there's that verse. You really are speaking to me. He is indeed. And it's a promise. This is a promise. Promise is made. Our promise is kept with our God. This promise that he is going to provide all you need generously. Doesn't matter that you're in, you know, this horrible global economy that feels like it's tanking. So what? You know who your God is? He's the one who says he's going to provide generously. It's a promise made, and I am counting it as a promise kept on your behalf. All right, I'm going to pray this over you now. Will you pray with me? Lord, I'm coming to you today in prayer with a heart that just longs for your people to receive the fullness of your promises to them, that we would be those who are quick to obey and thus receive even more of you speaking to us and leading us and guiding us and impacting others for your kingdom purposes. On behalf of the one who's listening to this podcast episode right now, no matter where they are in the world, in the U.S., in Canada, Kenya, Germany, India, Australia, Poland, Thailand, South Africa, the Philippines, France, Jamaica, the UAE, Guatemala, Italy, Nigeria, Peru, the Ukraine, Singapore, and Brazil, places that I know people listen to the podcast and hear about your promises, Lord. Would you bless them, Lord? Would you help them to know that right now they are being prayed for, that you see them, that you see them. If the place that they dwell was named, Lord, may it be a reminder to them that you see them, you care, you know what's going on, and you are with them. You're watching over them, and you're going to keep your promises to them. In any place that I don't know about where someone's listening, Lord, it's true for them as well, even to the farthest, most regions, corners of the world. Lord, would you right now at this moment, let them know how close you are to them. You are right there. You're the one who sticks closer than a brother, the one who will never leave them nor forsake them. Show up in their life, in their world, in what they're going through, and do it today. Put your hand of provision and protection on them. Cover them. May your banner over them be your love. May your blessing and favor be on them in ways that comfort them. Give them great hope. Grow their love and adoration and trust. And Lord, move mountains. Do your mighty miracles. Bless them richly, abundantly, generously provide all they need and all means all, just as you have promised. Lord, I didn't pick this verse. You wanted me to share it with them. Do what you want to do as I obeyed you and shared. Bless them in the ways that you want to bless them, Lord. This is your word and it's for your child today. Keep your word as I know that you will. You always do. May they have, starting right now, everything that they need and have it always with plenty left over to share with others. And may we be generous people. We receive generously from your hand. May we live open-handed, generous lives because we know that the one who generously opens their hand to the poor is, uh, is honoring you with the very core of our life, Lord. Let us not neglect to meet the needs of others in any way that we can where we have an opportunity to pray for somebody, help us to pray for them, to encourage somebody, help us to not put it off. Send the text, send the email, send the voice message, send the letter, go next door to the neighbors, do whatever it is that you know the Lord wants you to do. Lord, bless them in that. Make them brave where it seems scary and bless them in that, Lord. And having all that they need, may they always live glorifying and honoring you. May they obey as Joseph did right away, no excuses and no delays, and receive all the blessings that come with obedience. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering my prayer on their behalf today. You are worthy of all honor and all glory and power and blessing, and we praise your name. And I ask all this in your name, the mighty name of Jesus. 
Amen. It really is always a blessing to me to pray for others. And the one I'm praying for today is you. And it is a privilege and a blessing. I really do mean that. It's a gift that we can give one another. And it's a gift that ends up being a privilege for the one who does the praying. So thank you. And I mean it. Thank you for allowing me the privilege of praying for you and with you today. All right, be sure to check out the giveaway links. And I really do hope that you win. Winners are going to be announced by, oh, I'm going to say after the 4th of July, uh, after that holiday, it's not really a weekend, but the midweek holiday, uh, I'm going to say July 5th. I think that's a Wednesday. I'm going to be making the announcement uh, because there's different apps and all the ways the episodes are going to be like can be auto downloaded to subscribers and things and uh, add a little more time because it's summer. I want to make sure as many people as possible have the chance to possibly win and that I have enough time to um gather all of the names from the different places where you might leave a comment to enter the giveaway. So uh, July 5th. And if you win, I'll find you. If any of you have heard about the little girl Willa that we met on vacation uh, at a poolside at a resort years ago, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to say that as it's a Willa quote, a direct quote. And I'm going to say it just like her. No matter where you go, I'll find you. I'll find you. Okay. So if you're a winner, I'll find you just like Willa said. So I will find you um, if you are the winner. I promise I will. So thanks for making it possible for the Burt Not Ernie show to reach the milestone of 150 episodes. Literally could not do it without people listening. So thank you. I am so thankful and so blessed and blown away that, um, oh my goodness, I've made it to this number of episodes. I really am grateful. So thank you for helping me to do what God has called me to do. I hope that I help you to do what God has called you to do. There is no show without you. And you know what? You matter so much to God. I really want you to hear that above all else. You matter so much to God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. But thank you for being you and for loving the world and loving Jesus in the way that only you can. Hope to see you back here next time, and uh, I hope that you'll join me on the prayer podcast with Jan Elbert. Um, and um, you know what? I'll put up a link to the show on uh, my platform host, Podbean. Um, and then, of course, you're going to be able to just search for it on the Apple or you know Amazon, however you listen to podcasts or iHeartRadio. I'll get it added to there as soon as I can. Um, So thank you so much. I'm so excited about all the things, but mostly about God's promises to you in this episode, because he so laid that verse from 2 Corinthians on my heart. It's yours, my friend. Grab it, believe it, lean into it, and live knowing that the promises that God has made to you, he's going to keep them. He's going to keep them. All right, check out the links. And also, if you're worried about not winning, or if you have a prayer request, if you're worried about winning and not me finding you, you can screenshot me. Um, your entry. And if you rate and review the new show, that gets you like 10 extra entries into the uh, spinning wheel thing that I use to uh, the name, the drawing randomizer is what it's called. So you can send those to my email at J-A-N-L-B-U-R-T at outlook.com. Jan Elbert at outlook.com or be a direct message DMs on Instagram, Facebook. I will get your entries added in and I do hope you win. I guess I'm totally sort of bribing you to help the new show get that extra push because like reviews and things on the new pl- on platforms for a new podcast. Um, look, it doesn't take very long before they don't push your podcast out. And let's be honest, they don't push Christian podcasts out as much as they do secular ones. Like if I were hunting ghosts or something, that would be getting pushed like crazy. So your help to push this out so more people can hear God's word about prayer and be prayed for. I guess I am bribing you. Don't care. I'll do it all day long. Help me please to push this out in spite of the fact that the algorithm is against Christian podcasts. I appreciate it so much. Hoping to reach as many as I can with prayer with prayer. Thank you for your help. It means more than you will ever know this side of eternity. I had a lot of asks of you this show. I thank you for hanging with me and listening. I mean it when I say I am so thankful for you. Praying for you, my friend. Have a blessed day. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode that is part of the Spark Media Network that can now be heard on the Edify app. So glad you joined me for this episode of the Burt Not Ernie Show. It's an honor and a blessing to talk about God's promises with you. 
Have a fabulous day. And remember, part of knowing who you are is knowing who you're not. Lord bless. I'll see you next time.